Welcome to Virtual Realms. I'm Ranger One, and we're here on my Long Beach habitat that I have created, almost directly underneath the Blue Obelisk. I thought that it would be a good idea to show you what this habitat actually looked like from ground level. I've made some improvements to it lately that I thought you might be interested in, and uh, well, it's about time we developed this habitat into something to be proud of, rather than just using it as a dumping ground for partially mutated creatures. Right now we're at the westernmost end of Long Beach, as far as you can go. As you can see, the western end is capped off by high cliffs. There is one way where you could get up if you had a sure-footed mount or if you were climbing it yourself but well I don't really have to worry about any of my tames heading in that direction so let's take a little jog up the coast and I'll show you the full expanse of the Long Beach habitat now along the way if you've seen any of my previous episodes you're going to see plenty of tamed parasaurs and some untamed well unclaimed parasaurs as well. They have been breeding all on their own out here in the wild. As you can see there's tons of small islands and sandbars beside the beach. Plenty of shallow water with occasional spots of deep water. Megalodons lie just offshore and plenty of stingrays as well. So I only put animals out here that are not inclined to go in the water. I've had turtles out here before and there's still a couple running around but usually the megalodons make pretty short work of them. Now of course the biggest landmark here is the blue obelisk. This should be easy to find if you decide you like this section of beach, isolated as it is from most of the rest of the landmass here on Ragnarok. And the parasaurs seem to love hanging out beneath it. Now the only real way up to the highlands above and from there to the canal network where my bungalow sits is up this shallow incline right here. And I have occasionally creatures that, uh, of mine that wander up there and end up over by my bungalow. It doesn't happen too often. That's a little bit far of an incline for most creatures to want to wander up all on their own. Most of the creatures when they're operating under their own power uh, according to the dictates of their own AI, generally don't like going uphill that much. They prefer going downhill, which is kind of interesting for a computer simulation, but, you know, hey, such is life. Or unlife, as the case may be. Virtual life, let's put it that way. I've got a few Jerboas out here running around and some Pachycephalosaurus. Those are... Well, the Packies are new additions. I've decided to bring uh, a, a breeding pair and an extra male out here. And we're going to do a little breeding and let some Packies run around down here. I'm only letting the population increase in slow amounts. Uh, li little amounts. Because, frankly, there are very rarely any natural predators here. Other than the occasional Ichthyornis that flies over poaching Jerboa. The Jerboas were extremely populous down here, but I had a problem. Further inland, some got forced underneath the map in a steep cliff crevice. They fell partway down, got stuck, and were forced under the map. And my frame rates dropped to nothing as they geometrically increased their numbers underneath the grid. So I had to eliminate all the Jerboas, saving only my breeding pairs. They're bouncing back nicely up at Emerald Lake, and I've decided that I need to do the same down here as well. You'll see that in just a moment. Anyway, let's continue on past the Blue Obelisk. There are a few natural predators from time to time up top, but they're like Microraptors and Troodons, and they don't tend to come down here very often. About all we see down here on the beach proper is the occasional Delo or Pegomastix, and the Ichthyornis, which are a threat only to the smallest of creatures, so it's one of the safer places in Ark. Consequently, that means that I'm very, very picky about what animals I put down here, and I keep the breeding rates very, very restrictive. I don't want to overpopulate the area with too many animals. Not enough of them manage to meander off to other areas through that one way out that I just showed you. 
Now that is something I've been working on. We're going to take a closer look at the hatchery here in just a second. The Long Beach Hatchery. I'm going to run all the way down to the end of the beach just so that you see how far down it goes. I suppose one could potentially make their way up that slope right there to the right, but uh, it's not something that the animals are going to do all on their own. And here we come to the end of the Long Beach habitat. Now from this point on, it's just water. And if you've watched any of my videos that show the bungalow and the canals on the other side of these cliffs, that's the split in the rocks, the one deep water channel that goes through there and into that area. Since I'm sticking primarily with land-based land -based creatures here, that's not an escape route for them. Let's head on back over to this one long isolated island that normally doesn't have any spawns on it, I believe. Uh, perhaps the occasional Ichthyornis that lies here to the right. And I'll show you the, the hatchery that I've just put in. I've stabled west winds so that I can give you an aerial view of the actual beach that I've located the hatchery on. It's separated from the mainland by a narrow channel that exits near the blue obelisk. The island itself is little more than a sandbar really, anchored by some large rocks that capture the sand, at least that's what the looks would have you believe. And a few palm trees and scrub palms have taken root here. I decided to go ahead and put the hatchery here just because it was separated from the mainland. Not that there's many threats on the mainland, but I figured this was the safest place in the area and it has a great view. The jerboa that I had released here originally really liked it out here, and they they thrived. And I'm hoping that when I reestablish re the population that they will thrive here again. As you can see, it's long and narrow. Not much to speak of, but it's more than adequate for my purposes. The hatchery itself, for the most part, was made with Eco's Stable Structures and Decor mod, which hasn't been out too terribly long has a really really nice look to it I thought it worked pretty well for this application let's take a look closer we've also got a few decorative pieces here from some of Eco's other mods the main centerpiece here on the ground floor which I based on a, uh, a wedge from the platforms plus mod because it gives me a variety of heights that I can anchor walls at which is sometimes helpful when you're dealing with small creatures and small creatures are mainly what I want to populate this island and the whole Long Beach with. Um, but the rest of it, for the most part, is all Eco's work. Aside from a few other floor planks and the stairs over there. As you can see, I've given the Jerboas some extra added incentive, just in case they needed reminding of what lies in wait for them just offshore, should they decide to slack off on their mating duties. In here, I have Westwind safely stabled. I named him Westwind as an homage to Ralph Bakshi's wizards and the mounts that were used in that animated movie. And I've got other packies here as well. A total of three. I don't want to load this pen up too terribly much right now. They need to have room to move around. Eventually, they will get close enough to mate. But my main concern is having enough room for those babies there that are going to hatch soon to make it out safely without getting stuck on their parents. And that's why I have the strange arrangement here with the Structures Plus pieces because the pieces that come with Eco's mod will allow a baby Pachycephalosaurus to walk out but only if they line up just right between those supports. And eventually they might but tripping over their parents, uh, it was a little problematic. But they can walk out from under these pieces here just fine. Let's go upstairs and I'll show you what the, the main house looks like. You see, not only did I want a breeding facility with a roof over it to keep the ichthyornis away, but I also wanted a place to make camp. Hey, hey, hey! Jerboas. Always getting in where you don't want them. Now these are my simple digs up here. Uh, we've got some nice tack all over the place from Eco's mod. Small, large. There's a 
I don't know if you saw, there's a Pachycephalosaurus saddle down there by the pen. Um, but for the most part, this place provides me with shelter, an excellent view of my surroundings, uh, a little place to sit down, keep an eye on what's going on over at the Blue Obelisk, because that's where the Parasaurs like to hang out for the most part, and lots of storage. Also gives me a bed that I can spawn to, and I also have a Structures Plus teleport, uh, what would you call that, post pylon, uh, set up not far away. And if I really want to take a look, I can always come up here, have a seat, and check out the surroundings. It's a pretty nice view, actually. Now, if you haven't messed with this particular mod of Ecos, I think it's some of her better work. Everything's very tasteful. The roofs are excellent. I like the metallic look. It's kind of a coppery look, which is kind of unique and unusual. The lighting is nice. Anything from the hanging lights to the wall lights, the barrels, the hay, all the miscellaneous storage. And you know what? My trademark has always been the hat. And I look and on this storage thing, for some reason, she's put a hat there on the corner and I, I'd kind of like to think she did that thinking of me. <laughs> And of course out here is a small landing pad. I might be able to fit a Quetzal on this, but mostly because I'm dealing with smaller creatures here for the most part, I figure if it's just big enough for an Argentavis, uh, it'll work for me for right now. So I've had this place up and running for about a day, and so far it's doing pretty well. The Parasaurs have begun moving out here all on their own. Uh, they were starting to do that prior to my building the hatchery here. And the Jerboa population and the Pachycephalosaurus population is slowly starting to pick up from absolute zero to the point where I have quite a few youngsters and young adults running around. Including this cute little guy over here. Hi buddy, how you doing? Hopefully it won't take long for the population to get up to scratch. Uh, this island used to be covered with Jerboa. And I don't think it's going to take too terribly long to get us back to that point again. Oh, here's the teleportation pylon that I was talking about. This is <laughs> incredibly handy. I don't know why I wasn't using these before. All you have to do is go up to it and push the button. Teleport. I've got one at my bungalow. There's where we are right now. There's one at the bungalow. Well, let's just go there. And here we are at my bungalow. Now we're at Emerald Lake. Ooh, it's starting to get late. And now we're back in the cavern. That's pretty darn handy. One other thing that I like about it is you can set the radius. Well, here, we'll show the range right now. This is the shortest range, so it just takes you and whatever is immediately around you. Uh, there's its largest range, so you can get a lot of stuff in here if you really need to. And here's medium, which probably works for most of the time. But you can change that range to whatever you need it to be at a moment's notice. Let's head back. Ah, the whirlwind tour is over. What? I heard that. Who said that? Who said that? I see you over there. Oh, I almost forgot. Hidden away here in the back. I've decided I was going to build a dock. And I've got a spiffy little motor raft here just waiting to take me on expeditions up and down the coast I'm gonna to have to be kinda of careful with that though because just offshore a big oh whoa, 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 wait a minute are you here visiting? Did you come back? 
You need a snack? I'll get you something to eat. <laughs> it's going to have to wait a minute, though. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Here, just off the coast. Let's dive down. Big old lead sick this likes to hang out. So, if I'm going to take that motor raft out anywhere, I'm going to have to slip out either one end or the other of that channel and hug the coast and run like hell. I did have a dock sticking straight out from here too, but well, the thing about a dock is, you see right here the water's fairly shallow anyway. And if I put a dock out here, a lot of the animals got confused by that. It kind of messes up their ability to sense where the land begins and, and where it ends. Perhaps they pick it up as solid ground just a few feet away, but they, they had a tendency to walk out either on it or beside it and <laughs> end up in over their head. And unfortunately, the pathfinding of many of these creatures, like the Jerboas, They'll head in a straight line if there's land right in front of them, but if, boy, if they get thwarted and getting to that land, they st just start swimming in circles, and they can rapidly exhaust themselves, which well, I want to avoid that if at all possible. Uh, but it wasn't just them. The Pachycephalosaurus and the Parasaurus did the exact same thing. Usually they recover fine, but I'd rather just do without the dock, at least for now. Oh, shoot, while I was busy running my mouth, we had twins. Hi guys, or girls, or guy and girl. Can you make it? Do you need a boost? Oh. Well, they'll find their way out sooner or later. I kind of like the look of these rails, even though the packies can't get under it very easily, but they always manage to find their way over here and either go over the railing right there or down these steps. Uh, they're persistent little guys, and they just don't stop until they find a way out. I'll probably end up moving this desk and that storage out a little bit and making another pen right here um, as soon as I figure out what species I want to introduce here next. I think it's going to be something small, but we'll see. So that's the tour of the hatchery out here on Long Beach and the habitat that soon will be populated with a wider variety of creatures now that I'm going to put a little bit of actual work into it. I've got some uh, breeding pens that I need to set up for basic stock. I'm going to, once I decide what the next species is to introduce out here, I'm going to put pens right beside the hatchery here and raise my eggs out here. The cavern is a nice facility, but for smaller stuff, it's kind of nice to be out in the natural sunlight. Uh, the cavern lighting is a little dark sometimes, and it's just artificial light, and that, that makes it hard to see. So, frankly, I just need a break from being in a cave all the time. <laughs> it can be a little depressing. Now, I'm trying to decide what the next species is that I want to introduce out here. Something small, I think. Something that can help keep the uh, prehistoric seagulls from eating all my jerboas. I'll have to give that a little bit of thought. But I've got a couple of ideas. The thing about this area is, aside from the seagulls, there's, there are very few predators. So, whatever I put out here, I can't put a whole lot of them out here because they would very quickly overpopulate the area. So, uh, I'll have to use some discretion. And I don't want to put anything big out here because, well, frankly, along this narrow beach, big creatures would overpopulate it very, very quickly. If you're asking yourself, wow, how do his parasaurs and whatnot roam around without getting stuck all the time? Well, they do occasionally get stuck, but far less often now than they used to. Uh, the solution to that's actually pretty simple. Whenever I see a parasaur or other creature that's stuck between two of these pesky palm trees, they're kind of the bane of Ark's existence as far as dinosaur navigation goes. Everything gets stuck on those darn trees with very few exceptions. But whenever I see, say, a parasaur get stuck out there, I immediately go out to it. I use uh, one of Eco's mods to plop down a big rock, and I use that rock to hide a foundation. 
and then I chop down any trees that are so close together that they habitually get my creatures stuck. And over time, using the parasaurs primarily as kind of a detection system, I have found all the snag points, or most of the snag points, here on Long Beach. And now they rarely get stuck. I've got a few more rocks here and there, but I can live with that. They blend right in. Just a handy tip if you have wandering creatures around your own base that tend to get hung up here and there. Well, I've bent your ear long enough. Thanks for stopping in. This was just a quick video I wanted to put out and show you what's up on the, uh, uh, on the building front for this hatch and release series. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoy the series as a whole. I'm going to be doing some more building too because I've been neglecting that. I've been trying to perfect my technique of, of raising creatures and breeding for different color mutations and we're going to continue with that but I'm going to be doing a lot more building in the near future as well. So I'll let you go for now. Thanks for watching and thanks for subscribing if you have and if you haven't please consider doing so and if you think about it give me a thumbs up and maybe even share the video with a few of your friends. And I'll leave it there. Until I see you again, good hunting.